I'm so delighted to be here. I'm so happy with the work that Lev Gonick does. I'm particularly moved to be part of this for one economy and one community and all the work that they've done here in uh, Cleveland and in the Northeastern Ohio area. It's a very inspiring group. One community is a model for the rest of the country. And I first came to Cleveland more than 30 years ago as a guest of my then college boyfriend and his wonderful family. And I had lunch with him today. Lev gave me an hour off, which I really <laughs> thanked him for. And let's just call this guy Jim. Okay, Jim. <laughs> and um, he was a French horn player who was thinking about becoming a conductor. And my visit here then was all about music as well as romance, romance and music, because Cleveland is the city in which I first played the viola. I'm a violist. And I'd grown up as a violinist. Both my parents are composers, and I basically grew up in a practice room. And that Christmas, I decided I wanted to switch instruments to try the viola, and Jim's mother played the viola. And I picked up the deeply resonant sound of the C string, the string that the violin doesn't have, and all the voices inside that sound. It's not just one sound, it's many. And my listening was absolutely deliberate, and I kept my ears as open as they could be. What I was after was the thrill of making that sound as beautiful as it possibly could be. Even though I didn't fully understand at that moment what role the sound of the viola would have in the rest of my life, I had already begun a sort of musical journey. And this is going to connect to fiber, don't worry. <laughs> Everything I did next turned out to be just another door opening, not a destination, just another door. And it's that series of opening doors which have brought me, very fortunately, back to Cleveland today. And yet, speaking here with all of you in this garage, which is now a space of innovation, and all of you who understand what one community does and what impact it has on Northeastern Ohio, this feels like standing on a teleportation device. This isn't just another door opening. This is actually all of us as achieving escape velocity using what's possible with fiber. So that's why, for once in my life, I'm allowing myself to be transported. I did get a better job, in a sense. I was after that, um, by, by switching to viola, there are fewer violas, but I got a better job in the end by being a lawyer, because um, lawyers can support themselves. And Jim did too, oh, by the way, he became a lawyer also. <laughs> uh, but I never stopped playing the viola with great affection, and much of who I am has to do with music. You have to read this book by Daniel Levitan. It's called Music, the Brain, and Ecstasy. It's unbelievable. So music grabs hold of us and rattles us to the core, transports us to an abstract place far from the physical world that occupies our minds, and has heart-rending immediacy. It's the most immediate of all the arts, and the most ecstatic. At many, many levels, we hear order and transcendent beauty our brains are thrown into pleasant overdrive by music. Music causes us to actually believe we are, as individuals, more than we normally are, and that the world is more than it seems. So when it comes to American economic policy, I learned everything I know now by playing string quartets. So here are some basic propositions. You are no greater than your neighbor. No one should be left behind. Everyone has a voice. There is always something to learn from listening intently to that voice, listening with as much attention as possible. The combination of the voices is greater than the sum of its parts. No one needs to conduct, but everyone has to be highly skilled for anyone to benefit. No one does anything alone. Immediacy, experimentation, agility, Kindness and generosity matter. And I speak to you as an amateur violist, so you can trust me, there is no one more earnest and more desirous of being understood against all odds than an amateur violist. <laughs> In fact, I stand before you not only being teleported, but also at the intersection of two great spheres of jokes, the viola jokes and the lawyer jokes. <laughs> it's perfect, almost too perfect, that the demo for today was musical. 
Really, thanks for that. I appreciate that. There's nothing more human than music, nothing more true to life in our time and always. We want music to be not only immediate and generous and pleasurable, but also wise, calling us to our most spacious and kindly selves. And combining mus music with the affordances of fiber demonstrates the strengths of both. Because this is the truth. This is the music of the spheres brought down to earth. This is the finest music to make people through fiber truly present to one another. That's the thing that moving to fiber and the great work of one community can do. One strand of fiber can convey not only 90,000 television channels, but also potentially hundreds of thousands of lives being shared. Families separated, having dinner together, screens bringing lives together, communities connected. We don't yet know what this will be like, but we can imagine, and that should be enough to spur everyone to action, just as Lev and his colleagues have acted here in Cleveland. The transformative effect of fiber is as big a change to people's lives as electrification was, and as important as the advent of the internet. Let me say that again, the introduction of gigabit fiber in particular across the country will be as different from our current experience of the internet as the world was before electricity and afterwards, before telephone and afterwards, before internet access and afterwards. We don't yet know exactly what we'll do with it, but we do know we can't leave anyone behind because the music of all of this demands it. A great poet named Seamus Heaney recently died. He was much loved by many people, and he was fond of telling a story that makes this precise point. He talked about a monk named St. Kevin who was kneeling with his arms stretched out in the form of a cross. So Kevin, he's a stalwart man, he's contemplating the eternal, and as he's there, a blackbird swoops down and lands in his hand, lays eggs there, and nests in Kevin's hand. What does he do? He stays there for hours and days and nights and weeks, holding out his hand until the eggs hatched and the fledglings grew wings. Why? Well, from Kevin's perspective, it was his job to be a platform for the birds. He could, and so he did. One community has done such a great job of fibering up libraries and schools and public benefit organizations across Northeastern Ohio. My home city, New York, not doing quite so well. We learned recently that over 75% of school facilities in New York City have maximum download speeds of 10 megabits per second or less, 100 times slower, 100 times slower than the level the president wants us to aim for. There are real connectivity deserts in Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island and very high correlations between low-income neighborhoods and truly terrible internet access in schools and libraries. We're not being much of a platform in New York City. St. Kevin would be puzzled. Look, in many ways, many ways, America is in good shape. In fact, the best shape that it's ever been in. People are better fed these days on average. We've got low infant mortality. Child labor has become unacceptable. Illiteracy and unsafe water, we don't have that anymore. Goods are cheaper relative to incomes. But we've also learned that atmospheric carbon levels are higher than they've ever been in human history. Trust in government and other institutions is at historically low levels. Cynicism abounds. The honeybees are vanishing. And public school kids in New York City are being left far behind. So it's a paradox. We have these better lives, but they're increasingly difficult challenges, and it does seem that we've become disconnected. We are, in fact, more isolated than we have ever been, even in this age of Twitter and Facebook. Nipun Mehta recently gave a graduation speech that really struck me. He said, the average American adult reports having just one real friend that they can count on, one real friend. And for the first time in 30 years, mental health disabilities such as ADHD outbreak physical ones among American children. So here's our chance to support real-world ties with technology. 
because we're getting closer to full bandwidth communication. That's presence. That's the killer app. That's the music. What we're going to do here in America is combine presence, the thing people long for more than anything else, with ingenuity, our undying entrepreneurial spirit, which is the envy of the world. Because in South Korea, they've got better networks, but then they may have better connectivity, but they're not as innovative, really, as we are in America. Kids don't start things that are new there because they know that Samsung can just crush them. But here in Cleveland, you may be able to figure out how to make authentic friendship and change in communities possible over very high capacity networks. That's what's next. Presence, visual literacy, a new form of relating. Ingenuity is our comparative advantage as Americans. What will it take to get there? Well, the first key is to be generous at every level of communications capacity. Whatever it takes, we need at this juncture in our history to replicate the success of TCP IP, the open internet protocol that was given away at no charge to any computer that wants to speak internet. It was pushed with great energy by the US government. It became an instrument of our foreign policy. Everyone will think we have a hidden agenda, but it's just a best practice for open ecosystems. We need open standards to which Cleveland entrepreneurs can write new presence-based applications. This is just like clean water and abundant electricity. If we share this, even with people in foreign countries, we'll still do better. We did better with the first generation of the internet, and we'll do better with this next generation. I challenge one community to share what it has learned with the rest of the world very actively. We need to be generous with support for people who want to build fiber networks, just as Lev and his colleagues have done. The people who actually build networks are the heroes, not me. Lev Gonick is really important to this process. It really is a chicken and egg problem, and without local infrastructure, we'll never get the sandbox and the jealousy that will drive mayors to require that these networks be built for their citizens. Chattanooga, Tennessee just raised the stakes. They said yesterday that everybody in Chattanooga is going to get a gigabit for 70 bucks a month. Everybody. Symmetrical access. That mayor can really talk about fiber. You should hear it. He thinks it's the most important thing Chattanooga's ever done. And without mayoral jealousy and hard work that echoes one community's hard work, we'll never get the national policy forwarded by local infrastructure banks and mayors everywhere that will connect up all these gigabit networks and make them standard everywhere in America so that our national fiber capacity is the envy of the world, just like our phone network once was. It's a little odd, as someone I know said recently, that we're totally comfortable with the idea that a house comes with a water line, power line, sewer line, a gas line, no one imagines that these are some sort of huge, impossible investments to make. Yet there's this weird mental fog around running a physical fiber into your home. We got that way through public inattention to this issue, and we need to turn that around. So the first requirement is to be generous. The second requirement is to be inclusive. Kindness for all of us needs to be a way of life. The applications we build and the networks we forward need to be for everyone. We can't do this alone as a nation, as a democracy. Soldiers don't leave anyone behind on the battlefield. String quartets don't strand the violists. We can't afford to leave half of us behind when it comes to high-speed internet access. As people, we really do feel each other's pain, feel each other's pain and joy if we're listening at all. We need abundance for everyone. So that's the answer. We're in the middle of a paradox of disconnection in the United States. And the good news is that we all working together can repair this. We can find ways to invent and to comprehend larger structures of simultaneous order and surprise. That's what our minds do with music. And that's what's needed in our country now, a larger national narrative when it comes to communications policy. It'll help address inequality. It'll help drive our competitiveness as a nation. It'll help unleash the productivity of the middle class, now squelched in America. That's fidelity. That's true high fidelity, not to bring in another musical pun. <laughs> so 
onward. Thank you for honoring me. Thank you for giving me the joy of being here in Cleveland again. And I hope we have a wonderful celebration this evening together. Thank you. obvious to me that Susan should be our honored recipient this evening. She uh, is graciously, uh, graciously agreed to take a question or two. Lilia is uh, here to my right uh, and has a microphone if uh, anyone would like to ask a question about viola <laughs> or Jim uh, or uh, about broadband. Uh, I'm sure Susan would be only too happy to answer some of those questions. First question or comment goes to please. To my left. Oh, sorry. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. And then we'll go over to the left. Susan, thanks for your uh, remarks. I wonder if you can address the state of um, uh, the landscape as it, um, as it relates to the telecoms and their kind of structural opposition to some of the some viewers. Do you see any breakthroughs, or is this something that just has to be chipped away at um, on a policy level or from the grassroots? What are your thoughts about that? Well, thanks for that question. I, I write a lot about the nature of the market power that Comcast and Time Warner Cable have on the cable side, and then the totally separate wireless market where at and Verizon have enormous, not only power, but also influence in Washington. And they managed to create a world in which they face neither competition nor oversight. It's really, it's a beautiful thing. It's a very peaceful land. Uh, and uh, it's so obvious that this is going on at every level. State deregulation bills are passing right and left. The feds have just, they're whimpering, they're against the walls. So what's going to change is all the words that have to do with electrification. When electricity arrived, it really sparked the imagination. People said, oh, he's a really, he's a live wire. You know, there was something about the advent of electricity that drove people to say, I need that. <clears throat> Only when we held World's Fairs in the United States and people traveled especially to the Midwest to see how electricity was being used in houses did they get the idea that electricity was good for something beyond street lamps. My grandmother always called uh, the electricity bill, the light bill, because that's what she thought it was for, right? So what's going to spark the imagination, what's going to get people galvanized, I can do this forever, uh, <laughs> to really care about high capacity connectivity is seeing what's possible here in Cleveland using a gigabit network, seeing what's possible in Chattanooga, where that mayor is out, you know, raising his fist about the importance of fiber, S maybe visiting those places, doing a little fiber tourism, is going to help, but as mayors get jealous, that's going to change the landscape, and then gradually the feds will get the idea and we'll see changes in federal policy. This is too long a trail, this should happen more quickly, but absent presidential leadership on this issue, which we saw with FDR, he really took on electrical special interests. It was all private utilities at the time he came in, and 90% of farmers in 1935 did not have electricity. So he decided this was one of his big issues. We, we don't have that level of leadership right now on communications policy. And absent that, it's going to take this more emergent effort uh, at the very local level and then rise into a network of mayors. And just before we go to our next question, to read more about uh, Susan's view, not only can you read her blog and web pages, but uh, her book, uh, Captive Audience, is uh, highly recommended. Uh, you can, uh, because I gave you permission to keep your smartphones on, you can go to Amazon or your favorite online uh, book seller right now and you can order one and it'll be here in a couple of days. So, <laughs> our next kind of question or comment. Hi, I'm a fellow musician and I just had to ask, who is your favorite composer? Oh, I've never met a piece by Brahms that I didn't love. <laughs> yeah, we were listening to a little bit of Yeah, we were. Yeah. I, I've got a lot to say about that, but let's start with Brahms. It's really, really great. Thank you. Also great the old parts. Other comments, Any comments? or questions? We're gonna put the mayor on the spot. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know the mayor was here. That's right. You set me up for this. I know. Scott, in the commercial um, real estate market, oftentimes companies are looking for broadband access. Yeah. Yet they cannot find where the broadband access is yeah. and until you make an order. Yeah. Um, the terminology that's used is it's homeland security and therefore we cannot disclose. Is that 
federal policy and can we change the nomenclature in such a way that allows those disclosures to occur so investment can capitalize on the infrastructure investment you've referred to? Look, uh, my hometown is Santa Monica, California, and there a business located in Santa Monica knows that they're going to get fiber at a very reasonable cost because there's a municipal network providing it, and they know what, exactly what they're getting. And it's the first question that businesses ask these days. What's the connectivity? How can I you know, make sure that this is going to not be a barrier to my doing business? It is absurd that as a country, we don't publish the prices and availability of high-speed internet access. It makes no sense to me. Uh, but this information is, is just not made available. It is by other countries. You could just find it out. Uh, but not here. And it isn't really a matter of national security. It's just a matter of uh, keeping this issue slightly abstract and far away so that Americans don't wake up and figure out that actually we're being gouged right and left. So even in New York City, it, uh, you can't find out those prices until you get there um, and or make a, you know, a very elaborate attempt. And if, you, if you're a startup moving to Brooklyn, there may not be fiber connectivity even to buy. So uh, data collection and publication is a tragedy right now in this area and needs to change. And the FCC has the authority to change that picture. OK, I don't see any burning comments or questions. And there's, there's one, one, one more. And then this is going to be a good one, I can tell. Uh, Susan, what was uh, really inspiring is you said something like igniting imagination. Right. And that's what we have an opportunity once again. What do you imagine is possible? Where is the greatest impact possible? Health, education, environment? Where's the first big win in your mind? It's every national policy we care about is only policy, is only possible with very high capacity, inexpensive connectivity. Every, just think about it. Uh, we have terrible, soaring health care costs in America. Bring those costs down by making it easy for wellness programs to be delivered right in people's homes over fiber where you're actually interacting with a doctor with no delay. Humans can't handle delay. It feels too weird. We can't talk to each other. But with a very good connection, you're there, you're present. And lowering the cost of doctor's visits, that's a huge impact for the country. Climate change, you know, making it truly possible for you to work from home, keeping the character of rural areas in place, only possible with very high capacity connections. Uh, education, why is it that all the great open courses being offered by MIT and Harvard are mostly being accessed by kids in South Korea? Why is that? Because they can, they can get there and our kids can't. With, and imagine being not only part of a course, but present in that. So you're able to interact on equal terms with everybody else. I, I say to you that this transition is so transformative. Every wall in this building could be a screen that is that we interact with, that interacts with us, that is a seamless projection of another world. And that's, that's a big change from what we've got now. Staring into these tiny devices feels very primitive. And it must be that at some point those devices disappear and it's just uh, internet access, like electricity, is just in the air, it's just present and enables us to do anything we want to do without waiting at all. Ladies and gentlemen.